brought to you by Gray Orange and supported by LSE. We would like to thank our registration partner, Map My India, CX partner, Zentex, Session Partner Shiplight, Silver Partners Retron, Knowledge Partner Supply Chain Labs, and Industry Partner PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry. My name is Sri Raj Deshmukh and I will be the host for this session. We are now moving on to the next session on minimizing inefficiencies in perishables, commodities, and agri product supply chain. What could be the best course of action in Indian context? I would like to introduce you to the moderator of this session, Mr. Gaurav Bahethi, founder and CEO of Procall. Next, I would like to welcome the panelists, Mr. Sahi Mehta, Director of Bring Integrated Logistics, Mr. Varun Kurana, Co founder and CEO of Pro Farm Agri Products, Ms. Rubal Chip, Co founder and CEO of GZN Labs, and last but not the least, Mr. Satish Kumar, founder and CEO of Kratos Innovation Labs. We welcome all of you, and I would request Mr. Gaurav to take over from here and kickstart the session. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, would love to uh, introduce ourselves and uh, the rest of the panelists here. Um, I uh, I hope the session is insightful for everyone. Uh, if if any of you the audience have questions at any time, please feel free to drop uh, the direct message in the chat, uh, and we'll take it up. Uh, uh, we'll I'll probably start with me. Um, I started a company called Procall. Uh, we we are in digital procurement for enterprises and uh, commodities and perishables is something uh, we look at as a category for uh, procuring for larger enterprise companies in India. Uh, would love to hear from the panelists here, starting uh, with Varun. Uh, Varun, would love to hear more about uh, you and Crow Farm. Thank you, Gaurav. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Varun. I'm the founder and CEO at Crow Farm. We run a, um, a community group buying uh, portal for fresh produce uh, by the name OTP. And essentially, uh, what OTP is about, it's a uh, you know, farm to fork supply chain. And uh, the fundamental thesis on which we build the business is that uh, in India, uh, you know, we don't have cold chain, right? So uh, produce moves under ambient temperatures. And which is why it is very important that you move it quickly from farm to fork, because the longer it takes, the more it degrades, the more the nutritional value goes down, and the more wastages it sees, and correspondingly, the price goes up. So uh, the way we do it is that, uh, you know, we have uh, community leaders, uh, mostly who are women, and we have almost 5,000 plus on our platform in Delhi and CR today. And uh, they aggregate orders from their community. Uh, while they aggregate orders, we procure those uh, from the farm gate uh, through, I would say, almost uh, 10,000 plus farmers that we work across um, Haryana, UP, uh, Rajasthan, and then even MP and Maharashtra as well. And through a very fast supply chain, uh, we are able to move them to our community leaders. Uh, the community leaders receive uh, the goods early in the morning, and then they would distribute them in their neighborhood so that consumers get access to fresher produce, uh, which where the nutritional value is high. Uh, the price pricing is more competitive than the market because we experience very little wastage. And I think one big thing that we have accomplished as a company is that uh, the conventional supply chain, which sees 35 to 40% in wastage, we have brought that down by 10x. We see like 4% in, in wastages. So that is, uh, I would say, a you know, big, big feat that we have been able to accomplish. That's amazing. Would love to deep dive into it. Uh, thank you for the quick introduction. Now, uh, moving on to Sahil, would love to hear from uh, Bling about you. Sahil, uh, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Gaurav, and thank you, IANAI, for inviting me for this exciting uh, panel discussion on how to uh, reduce inefficiencies in perishable distribution. So, Bring uh, is a niche uh, intra-city last-mile distribution company specializing in perishable distribution. Within perishables, we work across multiple uh, products, right from fresh milk uh, all the way to fruits, vegetables, uh, meat, seafood. So anything that is from a 12, hour, uh, 12 to 24 hour shelf life all the way up to six months uh, in shelf life. And our belief, uh, Gaurav, has been that uh, the longer the product sits on the shelf of the retailer, the better the returns, uh, both uh, for the retailer, the brand, 
as well as uh, the intermediaries in between, right? And that's our objective to ensure that uh, in the shortest possible time frame, the products reach uh, the shelf. You know, these are temperature control products. Uh, these are ambient uh, products as well. A pan India presence across right now uh, 18 cities and work with uh, several uh, well known brands uh, in the categories uh, that I just mentioned. We're now scaling up uh, the value chain to actually digitize the entire process right from, uh, you know, uh, production site uh, that's the factory of the brand all the way to the shelf. You know, and that should be in play within the next uh, three to four months. Sounds good, Sahil. Thank you. Moving on to Rubel. Rubel, I uh, would love to hear more about you um, and uh, QZens. Thanks, Gaurav. So I am Rubel. I am the founder and CEO of QZens Labs. Uh, we are building tech solutions for fresh food management. Uh, our belief is that data-driven decision making can really reduce the wastage that happens, uh, especially in the food supply chain. And uh, we all know, as uh, mentioned earlier as well, uh, 40 to even 50% uh, wastage is happening throughout the supply chain that doesn't reach the table, uh, but is wasted or, or lost uh, during the transit and during the whole process of supply chain. And uh, our forte or our uh, specific core technologies are based on some sensors that we are using to measure um, internal biochemical processes that go inside the fruits and vegetables uh, and also meat. Uh, the uh, biochemical processes can tell a lot about uh, w w what is the current health of the commodities and also help in predicting the shelf life. Uh, we uh, offer solutions for warehouses as well as for logistics uh, where, as I said, in transit a lot of uh, wastage is happening. Uh, we measure in real time the gaseous compounds as well as the physical uh, parameters to predict the life and also help in preventing the wastage that happens. Sounds good, Rubel. Interesting problem. Uh, Satish, would love to hear more from you and uh, Kratos Innovation Labs. Tell us more about us. Good afternoon uh, to the panel and all the audience out there. My name is Satish Padolkar. I'm the founder and CEO of Kratos Innovation Labs. So we are a pure blockchain and AI company uh, headquartered in Singapore and with a center of excellence uh, here in Hyderabad, India. What we have built is a super app for smartholder farmers, wherein we track everything that they do on a blockchain platform. We assist them during the pre pump get activities with a spatial imagery. So our objective is to actually create, increase the yield and also reduce the middleman. So from the first mile to last mile, we typically are on the first mile sort of it, procurement, and making sure the produce you know, reaches our B2B buyers or consumers within next eight to 10 hours. Uh, it's all built on a blockchain stack, and we'll be happy to you know, answer any questions later on. But that's our introduction. Thank you very much. Got it. Uh, thank, thank you for the quick round of introductions, everyone. Uh, I think it would be great to deep dive into what are the challenges that you forced that you uh, that you started the company with, found out for your customers, and uh, dig in deeper to solve these problems. Uh, where did the journey begin in terms of initial pain points of the customer and what were the challenges they were facing. Uh, would love to hear more on this, uh, Varun, from you. What were the initial challenges and pain points you found for the end customer for you? Sure, sure, Gaurav. Happy to brief on that. So, uh, see, we have a five-year history in the business. So when we started to, you know, solve the supply chain for fresh, you know, the I would say the biggest challenges that we saw were the fact that you know, at the farm, when you look at produce, right, it looks so fresh. And, uh, you know, when you inquire about the prices at which farmers sell, that is, you know, nowhere compared to what we pay in the cities. So, you know, that is, you know, a, a natural dilemma, which kind of, you know, got us started. And uh, so, you know, as a first step, I would say the supply chain in India, it's, a, it's an extended supply chain, you know, from farm to aggregators, goes through one or two mandis then to your local store, and that is where 85% of India buys their fresh produce from, and then finally consumers pick it up. So uh, when we started, see, we kind of had that understanding key, you know, in one shot, uh, and as a startup with limited resources, 
uh, we knew ki you know we can't get you know all those consumers also in one shot and then you know get the farmers in one shot that is a tough problem to humne kaha isko thoda sa shrink karte hain and uh, because before this i was the chief technology officer at grofers so you know we started off ki chalo you know let's procure from the farm and let's you know supply to grofers that's an easy sell so we started off with that uh, then we also graduated to what i call the horeca segment which is the hotels restaurants caterers but uh, you know along the way there were i would i would say uh, you know one or two challenges that we ran into so for example if you talk about the horeca segment the horeca segment mein uh the biggest challenge is ki their payment terms are you know very very high matlab 45 days 60 days and the bigger you know worry is ki as the business grows you know should you be happy or should you be sad because mm-hmm. you know you need more cash to sustain that business so i was like ki you know this is a this is a tough one and you know not sure whether that is a business we want to build and honestly when covid happened like in march uh, last year to so a lot of restaurants and all they went bust and a lot of people who were supplying to them actually lost their money so that is what happened um on the contrary when supplying to the modern retailers you know one of our big learnings was that uh, <clears throat> you know it's a market which is very lopsided when i say lopsided so think of it as ki you know the number of farmers in india is huge everyone on an average has a hectare of land so in a hectare uh, you know the produce that grows is in tons now if you look at the number of entities that can consume in tons there are very few right ek to mandis hai uske alawa you know if you talk about these kind of setups there are very few you know you can count them on your fingers it's not a lot so the purchasers they are typically you know, even for 10 paise 20 paise you know the deal goes here and there so uh, again the question was ki you know is this sustainable you know how you know will it ever be because you know it's too lopsided in the favor of a few buyers then yeah, finally yeah. we started serving the mom and pop retailers and that mm-hmm. is where we actually had a very good learning so what happened is and i'll you know take the example of let's say a commodity like oranges right so a retailer who is in the business and understands fresh you know he is very very conscious of shelf life <clears throat> the reason is ki let's say if i supply him oranges you know he typically assumes that i have 3 days to sell my oranges now if let's say i supply him oranges by keeping them one or two days at our warehouse and then giving it to him he will be like ki jinko bechne ke liye mere paas 3 din hote hain ab aap se maine liya hai to mere ko ab khali ek din milega to mera to nuksan guarantee hai wo to hoga hi hoga so which is why uh, you know he would look at the produce and he'll understand ki ab tumhara na isme ye purana hai ye chalega nahi to lega nahi so that was uh, that is where our you know understanding of shelf life kind of came in and then we you know backward made our systems and warehouse systems so that they the produce would just flow through you know it wouldn't spend time at all and so on so i would say that was one of our key learnings when we you know attacked that market got it um so, and then sorry yeah actually would come in deeper on that one uh, but just just for uh, understanding the scope of the whole problem uh, which everyone is solving here coming on to sahil which part of the problem segment uh, did you find and how did you discover that so you know uh, varun actually hit the nail on the coffin where he said that the retailer will uh, evaluate the product from the time that it is available to sell on the shelf and the story remains the same whether it is uh, fruits and vegetables or ready to eat ready to cook products or uh, uh, you know uh, milk or milkshake or any other dairy product so uh, we realized that uh, you know and this actually happened from a personal experience right uh, where i realized that uh, the product available at a particular store of the road has uh, probably far lesser shelf life and the reason for that is that the distributor delivered it uh, very close to the expiry date right and uh, after doing a deep dive into trying to find where the challenge is lie uh, we realized that while the brand would have the product ready uh, you know production plus one after packaging etc by the time it reaches uh, the shelf it is uh, expiry minus 2 right so if a typical shelf life of a product is say 7 days right uh, about close to 3 to 4 days in some cases 5 days it is lost in transit now this transit could be from manufacturing site to distributor distributor to stockist stockist to the uh, potential uh, shelf right so uh, 
the loss is suffered by the entire value chain. Right? Not only does the retailer reject a product because of reduced shelf life, but from a brand perspective, the RTOs increase tremendously, right? And post RTOs increase the cost of disposal. Right, because now that's become a larger challenge uh, in the perishable industry in India, right? right. Where, uh, you know, uh, the regulatory authorities have come down heavily on certain brands to ensure that the products are disposed in the right manner and not just dumped down the road. So the cost of disposal becomes very high for the brand. And all of this eventually uh, is uh, hitting the bottom line of the brand. So what we ensure uh, and what we've uh, done successfully, uh, Gaurav, is, uh, you know, we have reduced or rather increased uh, for that matter, the shelf life uh, by ensuring that the product lies on the shelf for at least 80%. Sorry, between around 70 to 80%. I think it was between around 70 to 80% Got it. of the actual okay. shelf life, the product stays on the shelf of the retailer. Okay. And uh, consequential to that, the uh, returns due to expiry, and I'm not talking of returns due to uh, no sale, talking of returns slash uh, uh, due to expiry or wastage has uh, come down by almost uh, 12 to 15 percent right. and and that is huge when you talk of volumes right yeah uh, and we're talking of huge brands here we're talking of uh, crazy uh, volumes across uh, india because india is a huge consumption right and there are so many homegrown brands that are coming up uh, which require distribution network on a pan india basis right uh, in uh, Taking cue from that, we actually help brands uh, scale up quite rapidly uh, across various geographies. We've got, uh, currently, we've got close to about uh, 1,800 retailers on board, you know, and uh, these keep multiplying by thousands every time we activate a new city, right? So currently, between two cities, we've got around 1,800 retailers where we can provide access to homegrown brands who require a distribution network. Got it. Ruble, uh, in this case, who would the end customer be? So for us, uh, the end customer is uh, uh, anyone who's holding a fresh food inventory. Uh, it includes uh, even post-harvest uh, wholesalers, uh, retailers, exporters, cold chains. So anyone who's holding inventory or moving the inventories is our customer. Yeah. How did you come by uh, about this problem, challenge they were facing? Right. So uh, initially, we did look at the whole uh, fresh food supply chain wastage that was happening, and uh, we wanted to uh, use technology to address this problem. Uh, we realized that um, first thing is always like whatever you want to solve, you have to first measure, right? And we also deeply believe that. So we realize. Uh, the decisions are based on something where we don't even know. For example, if you buy a packet of biscuit, you know the shelf life because uh, it's given on the packet. But for fruits, vegetables, meat, it's mostly uh, guesswork because uh, nobody knows when was it harvested. And even then, rate of degradation gets hampered by a lot of things like physical parameters, temperature, humidity, as well as, uh, as we know, a rotten apple sitting around a good pair of apples, it will change, interfere the rate of degradation for everyone. And that's why we realized first we have to measure and know the current health, only then we can predict the future and shelf life. So uh, we, after constantly engaging with some of the retailers and wholesalers, we realized uh, about kind of solution. We knew the problem. We somewhere knew the technology also that can be used, but to understand what kind of deployment would help, uh, we uh, really uh, researched on the customer uh, uh, facilities and we, we studied uh, the processes and then we were able to understand what kind of deployment would be suitable. Got it. Uh, and finally, uh, Satish. Who, who would your customer be? How did you came across their problem? We are purely a first mile at the moment. The customer would be obviously small world farmers and uh, digital aggregators. So we work on a cluster level. So maybe 10 to 12 villages okay. where we have created micro entrepreneurs. So one of the pain points are when we spend a lot of time with farmers, and especially tribal farmers and other people, What's happening is that the typical example is a plot that is harvested at four o'clock <clears throat> before the sunset, and the produce lies in their in a house or the farm until two, three in the morning because Monday is open only at three o'clock. So you're already losing about eight hours of freshness there, if not more. 
and then when they reach the mandi right so uh, most people are not aware that the okra we we pay for 40 50 rupees you know, in our urban areas or otherwise the farmer only gets 6 rupees at the most per kilo and then they pay the cess and there is a waste station and everything so take home is at an average of 5 rupees that happens so we looked at solving two problems here one if you could reduce the aggregation time uh, more like an hyper local time so by by four four harvest happens by six o'clock it reaches the local aggregator and we connect directly to the buyers right so agri industry buyers so that it reaches actually by 11 or two o'clock in the morning and they're not dependent on the mondays anymore so it's a digital platform the other thing what we bring to the table is it's not about only the harvest part of it we also show a lot of pre-harvest data uh, that actually increases trust between all these parties that is what we try to solve so i'll come in on deep down solution data but that's a problem we're trying to solve got it thanks thanks for this Sadish. so broadly i think people are trying to solve different parts of the supply chain but sure. looking at one core problem which is uh, shelf life or how fast things can uh, get to the customer eventually uh, I think it will be great to understand the different types of solutions people are building to optimize the shelf life problem. And, you know, the solutions can be very, very different and innovative in nature. And that's how best ideas actually emerge out of. Um, I think everyone here has decent enough of experience working with either farmers or FPOs or Mondays or end customers hearing about their problems, uh, learning more from uh, their peers on how are they actually trying to solve this problem because you know many people have tried uh, or have either become unorganized proprietor businesses or uh, are not an organized business at all so would love to hear from um, you know let's start with varun here varun what is the solution and why do you think this is a unique solution for the challenge writer solving up across all other solutions that you've thought of sure so see what we have done is that uh, you know we try to identify points in the supply chain where uh, you know time more time is elapsed so for example a lot of time is spent at the produce sitting at the stores right and that is a major wastage point for all kinds of fresh produce and in india by and large these stores don't have cold infrastructure so even if you have cold chain at the back end, you know, eventually when it reaches there, the cold chain falls through and the degradation, degradation is even more rapid. So what we have done is that instead of that, we have created these community leaders who are, think of them as, you know, the new age retailers, if you will, who will not stock. So the produce will come and they'll just transfer it down. So that time, which can normally be like 24 hours, 36 hours, in our case, it is one to two hours because it just comes and it goes. So that is, you know, one big change. The second thing that we have done is that, uh, see, when you're moving produce, right, the there's a decision point at every hop that happens that who is the next buyer. So that is, again, something which takes time. So we said, Ki, let's change all of that and let's build a system where even before the harvesting has started, our orders from consumers are already coming in. So by the time it is harvested, we already know where it is supposed to go. And mm -hmm. then it is just about how quickly you can zip it through the system. So those are, I would say, the two fundamental changes that we made. So you know, in terms of use technology, so that the decision making happens before the harvest rather than after the harvest. Mm -hmm. And second is that instead of having, uh, you know, retailers who stock, we created these community leaders. And today, you know, we have, like I was saying, all you know, five thousand plus community leaders, mostly women. We move more than two thousand five hundred tons of produce every month. And uh, we have over uh, almost, I would say, two lakh households in Delhi and CR that you know we have served. So uh, that is the scale at which we have reached today. How much would these community leaders be making uh, who are on the platform selling? See, we an average community leader for us does twelve to fourteen orders, and on that they would make anywhere. And see, this is just morning, so it's just one two hours in the morning that they need to spend. And on that, they would make at least, I would say, 12 to 15,000 rupees uh, a month. So overall, it is a very non-intrusive activity because their normal day schedule is not impacted. It's, you know, one, two hours in the morning. And uh, it also builds a very social goodwill because what happens is that 
you know the the feeling in the community is that oh you know i'm spreading freshness you know i am it's it's for the goodwill of the farmers it's for the goodwill of you know the community and it also creates like a you know social talking point within the community Absolutely. i mean in india it's a norm when you uh, send fruits to a family member they remember someone had sent fruits to your home uh, and i feel the same way here correct uh, interesting yes. uh, sahil uh, what what is the solution that you are intending to build to solve the shelf life problem and uh, why do you think it's very different from the other approaches so i think gorav uh, you know uh, when you talk of perishables uh, there are two parts uh, in my opinion right one is obviously uh, the product itself so so the taste of the product that you're buying and the second uh, attraction for a consumer is the packaging now obviously i'm not talking of uh, fnb because that's for loose but uh, other brands packaging plays a very very important role right and when you talk of packaging uh, can you can you share some examples in which categories you mentioned so i'm talking of uh, anything which is fresh so like for example let's say uh, paneer right uh, let let's talk of paneer let's let's talk of uh, canned food or bottled uh, drinks or, or whatever right so the minute uh, all of this uh, goes on the shelf one of the attraction for the consumer or or at least the inquisitiveness uh, for someone is the packaging which attracts uh, them right uh, and i'm not talking of the design or the graphics uh, on on the uh, packaging but the actual packaging itself and when you talk of packaging uh, automatically handling plays a key role right because how you handle uh, you know if if it's handled poorly in transit uh, while being distributed packaging but natural is going to get spoiled now whether the, if, if the product inside may be edible it could be as fresh uh, as it is but if the packaging is bad the consumer is not going to even take it right because there's there's a common human mindset that uh, agar bahar ka uh, look and feel bura hai to andar ka product bhi bura hoga you know that that's a typical uh, mindset for uh, any consumer and and uh, all of us are of the same mindset right? so uh, along with packaging handling plays a key role and uh, what we've realized from past experiences and my personal uh, experience from the uh, aviation uh, background because apart from uh, intracity last mile we also do intercity on air for fresh products right so uh, and, and these are again uh, products which are used for same day consumption as well right. so now when you talk of uh, uh, intercity by air your know, handling plays a key role right mm. which is uh, whether it's an airline or an airport operator or a cargo warehouse uh, terminal operator for them it's a simple uh, cargo which is probably 5 kg 10 kg and uh, whatever freight associated with it but the actual value of the product could be in hundreds or thousands at times right so what we've done uh, gorov is uh, we've trained our team uh, in a very very uh, uh, you know the gone through uh, detailed uh, sessions of uh, perishable handling right how how it is placed in the vehicle how it is eventually handed over to the consumer to the retailer you know at the airport level how it is handled so these these are uh, key uh, pain areas for uh, all the uh, stakeholders right from the brand to the retailer at quite often we've also seen due to poor handling the retailer also rejects it you know mm-hmm. because uh, and i'm not talking of uh, modern trade but i'm talking of general trade or, or uh, normal kirana shops right they would also like to see an attractive packaging Correct. So uh, handling and packaging plays a key role uh, along with distribution. Got it. Okay. And we have experienced that. Yeah. Got it. And uh, I believe you provide uh, the best solution in in this to solve. Uh, obviously, temperature control. So we work with partners, uh, you know, uh, across uh, the spectrum for uh, pre cool boxes, uh, you know, temperature control uh, boxes uh, from uh, which which can be used in ambient vehicles as well. apart from the vehicles itself right interesting who will uh, what's what's your take on this uh, the unique what was the solution about and uh, how is it different to solve the same problem right right so uh, yeah i think we are all addressing the same problem uh, different aspects of it uh, so for us uh, our major focus is on understanding the uh, health of commodities and uh, hence predicting so we are using some uh, some sensors are based on near infrared spectral sensing while there are some sensors which are based on 
sense of smell uh, so we know for food uh, the sense of smell is a very good indication be it fruit for the maturity as well as for the uh, uh, spoilage and also for meat and uh, seafood uh, again smell uh, so how does the smell work is mostly uh, there are some chemical compounds being produced and uh, if we are able to assess that we are able to know their current health uh, rate of degradation and hence predict the shelf life as well so That's uh, so what you are saying is uh, your technology can smell the fruits and identify the freshness of the fruit that's exactly. pretty incredible so that's one one of the sensor we are using yeah that's pretty incredible but uh, would love to understand how that works because i've never seen technology like that in play in this market for sure is this technology being right. used in some other sector or um, this is invented by you yeah yeah so uh, the sense of smell is one of the so our like digitization started with uh, replicating human senses uh, so the visual has been uh, captured by camera audio as well with microphones uh, touch as well as with uh, some of the mechanical sensors which can sense the shape and size but se sense of smell is the most complicated uh, because it is sensing the chemical compounds and each chemical compound is its own testing to know uh, the the amount as well as the specificity and uh, the the also the amount of chemical being produced so uh, that's why the olfaction is the sense which is uh, most complicated to replicate right yeah. uh, yes it has been yeah. used in industries uh, especially in, in pharma and also in wine and uh, alcoholic beverages uh, the sensors similar sensors are used but were used mostly uh, on an industrial level more uh now uh, with uh, the manufacturing technologies helping the uh, decreasing the size of sensors now um, we are seeing uh, some companies uh, trying to develop these e noses uh, as a portable device to sense the the aromas yeah wow that's amazing thanks for the insight sir uh satish a uh, quick thing what is the solution and how is it different it's it's basically a an android application that we built so look at the rural population so the adoption today is about 55% or 60% of the of the smartphones i'm talking about everybody has their feature phone also but if this if the farmer does not have a smartphone we normally link them or attach them to a, the micro entrepreneur or the digital aggregator so they would send his stuff to go and record one of the usps that we provide here is the live uh, data availability about when they are actually harvesting so typically 4 to 6 pm so the buyer that has already placed order as what we're not saying so the actually it's all pre-sold two or three days before so there's no dependency or money that the asset value goes down if they, if they can't sell it's already pre-sold all we are now guaranteeing is that from 4 to 6 pm it's aggregated it gets onto a truck within two hours everything is typed so they can verify the provenance which is a first mile part of it then everything is put on the blockchain, so it's, there's a lot of trust we are creating. And when it's going to the warehouse of, for example, a big aggregator, so we are now actually making sure it reaches within four to six hours, depending on where they want that to be delivered. So by doing so, a couple of things that we are trying to solve is obviously increasing the revenues for the farmers. Second thing, the freshness remains the same. And we are giving clear understanding about when the produce was actually harvested. So it also goes on the food safety part of it. Recalls become easier. Something goes wrong, they could trace back much, much faster. And then the farmer, uh, sorry, and the consumer part of it, so they have the full traceability available. So they actually scan a QR code on the packaging to see that where it came from, which farm or which cluster, and how it is benefiting a farmer. So a couple of things we have solved it. It's live in the Play Store at the moment. We have also you know, were able to scale it up in Kenya at the moment and other parts of the world. So I hope that that's useful for, for all the audience. Yeah, certainly. So broadly, uh, I see new solutions that I believe can solve the problems uh, in quite many different ways. But if any of these you know, scales up to a large extent that can serve India's agriculture economy, I believe the impact that is it's going to create among the farmers or the um, community leaders in uh, one's case or the end customer is going to be uh, phenomenal. For each of the uh, segment, I believe 
I don't think anyone has ever questioned that if any of these solutions do work, uh, the kind of impact it can make in the economy. Uh, with that thought, uh, I have a few questions uh, from the panel, uh, from the audience, and uh, would love to see who, who can take these up. So uh, starting with, has the agri-product business developed the capacity to be able to cope with the possible third wave? Uh, and uh, I believe uh, Sahil would be the right person to judge this uh, since he's completely involved in the full uh, value chain. Uh, Sahil, what do you, would you like to take this up? So, uh, you know, agri is something that uh, we do, but to know whether the supply side uh, is able to cater for a potential third wave is something that uh, I didn't think I would be able to. Maybe uh, Varun, uh, because he works directly with farmers, would be in a better position to actually, uh, you know. Sure. So we have, uh, see, we have seen the COVID first wave, second wave. Um, in the first wave, uh, it was, uh, you know, the mandis were actually dysfunctional for uh, some time because there was a lot of scare and there was just a lockdown. So at that point in time, actually, uh, it was, uh, you know, we came in very handy in the sense that uh, farmers had produced, which was ready to be harvested. You know, the mandis were not functional, so they had to sell it somewhere because if they didn't, then it'll, you know, rot in their fields. So we were able to at least, uh, you know, get some of it, move it through our system, get it to consumers. Now, the good part in our cases, and, you know, you could <clears throat> count this as being COVID friendly, is that see, typically when, you know, you go to a shop to buy fruits and vegetables, right? You, you know, there are lots of people who are, there's a lot of handling that goes through, you know, picking, choosing. Uh, every consumer comes, you know, he'll pick his bit and then, you know, the next guy is going to come, he's, has, he's going to have his share of picking, touching and so on. So in our case, the good part is that, you know, as soon as the produce enters the warehouse and, uh, you know, first QC check happens, then beyond that, uh, what we do is that the packing process starts. So it almost works like an assembly line. So, you know, QC, then packing, then it goes to the picking bay. While packing is happening, you know, the picking is also happening in parallel. So it's all like an assembly line. And that's the only way, we, you know, at OTP that we can move things so fast. If you make it a serial process, then, you know, each process is going to take two, three hours of its own. So, but as soon as the packing process happens, uske baad, there's no one that would touch that produce. Uske baad, it's going to completely be untouched. It's going to go all the way, you know, to the consumer. It's only going to be opened at the consumer's uh, desk. So this is, you know, one more, I would say, way in which we make sure that it is, um, you know, it's COVID friendly in, in a lot of fashion. It will you know, decrease the degree of infection to some degree. Other than that, uh, one thing that I can also say is that our the farmers that we procure from are usually qualified farmers, you know, who there's certain basic agri practices that they follow. You know, it's typically <clears throat> like in Delhi, you know, we have this big problem that there's a big chunk of produce that grows at the Yamuna belt. And mm -hmm. there is, um, you know, there's arsenic and lead and uh, there's this contamination that's there. So ideally, you know, you would not want to procure that kind of produce. And in our case, the good part is that, you know, there's, uh, you know, those kind of cases we are able to avoid because the sources that we are procuring from, we have a very good sense of, you know, their agri practices, the soil health and so on and so forth. So I would say, you know, I, I can't say 100% uh, resilient to COVID third wave, but yes, you know, uh, you know, COVID in general is something that I think for all of us, you know, none of us can be 100% safe from it, right? We just, you know, the vaccine only decreases the probability, you know, not having bigger gathering only decreases the probability, you know, it, it doesn't guarantee that, you know, you won't succumb to it. And I think these are the set of steps that we do to decrease the probability. No, that's very insightful. I think uh, Sadish also would have something, I mean, besides on Yeah, that's right. To add to what Varun is saying, right? So in fact, the spatial imagery that we have been now putting across, that exactly solves the problem, right? If there are too much of uh, micronutrient stress that's happening or too much of the stress that our special major picks up. So we, as we said, it's not only the harvest part of it, we are also taking care of the pre-harvest part, starting from the soil preparation all the way to, you know, your growth patterns, right? So the problem that is solving and especially what we observed in the COVID-2 and COVID uh, last year is that if you are able to tell the behind the lens story, I know there's a good probability that, you know, even the consumer feels more comfortable minimize the touch points so if you could do a bit of grading at the farm gate and then you tag it and then hand over to companies like you know, crow farm so they, they are also minimizing the touch points 
and in the end the consumer is now able to actually see you know where the produce came from how it was handled and what they are eating if they have minimum less than four touch points or uh, three touch points i think there's a good probability that they will trust this source they'll trust the quality of it and that's probably one what we can be prepared for the unfortunately if it comes up covid 3 we hope it doesn't come through that is right. my personal opinion we shall be safe yeah i believe uh, humans always adapt <laughs> and uh, so are our businesses adapting so uh, with each uh, such instances i think we are just getting better on how to deal with the situations uh, we have few more questions uh, and i'll probably just point them to a single person from here uh, rubel there's a question on uh, what is the scope of the use of ai in agriculture products market I think since you are working with sensing technologies um, would love to hear your thoughts about overall what do you think on this uh, so the uh, question is on uh, the scope of ai uh, for agriculture yeah what is the scope of ai in agri market agri market so yeah agri produce agri produce yeah so yeah agri we generally divide into pre and post harvest uh, pre harvest uh, obviously we are seeing uh, precision uh, agriculture where uh, sensors are used uh, to measure and and optimize the amount of water being used optimize the amount of nutrients being used uh, now as we are seeing a greater adoption of hydroponics and aquaponics uh, we also don't need soil uh, we just need exact new nutrient amounts and can easily uh, reduce the pesticides being used and and you make it more clean process to produce food with just exactly the nutrients and the water content needed to grow the plant right that's i think first level of optimization in growing the commodities more effectively and efficiently where we are reducing the wastage of water nutrients and overall uh, making it more efficient then the the next decision mostly mostly whenever we need to apply ai uh, there should be some decisions which we are taking right now and how can we optimize it i think the next level is the maturity right uh, again mostly the maturity predictions are either on a sample basis where the commodities are being harvested and being tested i think with better uh, data and uh, sensors we can predict that more accurately hence make the decisions uh, more efficient and data driven uh, reducing again the amount of wastage that happens uh, and also making the whole process efficient in post harvest which we are uh, currently dealing i think major decisions are of uh, basically the commodities shelf life as we are addressing uh, predicting that accurately predicting that for different environments for example if you are storing it cold uh, at a certain temperature what is the shelf life that can be uh, achieved if you don't have that facility what is the shelf life that can be achieved and and, uh, and then make decisions of uh, which inventory lot to be sold first and then uh, also optimizing the price uh, understanding the price dynamics also oh. optimizing the price and reducing your overall uh, losses uh, using this so this is the major challenge yeah so pretty much across the value chain the areas of ai will never stop to uh, surprise us i believe in this sector uh, so one thing i can add there is that we have also built ai data sets for deep fusion especially on the pest detection So everything in the pre-harvest stage that's also very very important to increase the yield and also reduce loss of the crops for the farmers. Uh, that's something what we have already built it. I thought that would be useful. No, um, I think uh, as more and more data around uh, the entire value chain is captured, the applications of AI are going to rise from here. Right? The data generation has just begun, uh, and so uh, it's just going to take its fair amount of time and how fast this data is gathered across the value chain. so uh, one one last uh, question we just have a few minutes left um, i think the overall concern with indian ecosystem uh, is that uh, while online marketplaces are working to solve problems with directly with farmers government has set up few initiatives to solve this problem and uh, create direct market linkages uh, however given uh, even the fastest adoption of internet penetration has increased multifold uh, would love to understand uh, what is the in, like penetration uh, of internet and mobile across uh, the rural ecosystem that you guys work with and uh, 
what is the scope of realization of you know digitizing the end uh, producer so i can take that so because we've done a lot of research on the first mile start of it so as i earlier said we have 50% 6% smartphone availability on the google side definitely the data is, uh, is available and the towers are there and the second point that we're looking at is in india we have 126 million farmers out of that 87% are into smallholder category that hold less than a hectare of land and this they account over 100 million farmers so i think in the next 3 years what we're predicting on the digital transformation is about 3% uh, the reason being such a low number and to start off and that would actually compound in the in the years to come come across is that uh, there's a little bit of cultural issues as well as on the ground the people saying that why should i you know take pictures of my uh, you know produce uh, why should why are you tracking my geolocation why are you tracking sending satellites to look at my farms uh, why should i why, why should i use your data sets right so that is what we are getting sometimes pushback they say uh, we will try but you know don't expect some some results coming in that is my take from our whatever we have done it other more our other panelists might have their information uh, more updates on this so gorov you know it's uh... Exactly the contrary and opposite in the segment that we operate, right? Where uh, the uh, manufacturer or the brand is completely adopted to digitization, automation, uh, technology, etc. But the uh, customer and over here the retailer, and I'm not talking of uh, the modern trade, but a large part of the general trade is uh, still, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, very basic. Uh, technology. I mean, smartphones is pretty much a given, but apart from that, that's that's what it is, right? So, where we are helping uh, retailers also at some point uh, digitize their uh, supply side or, or their procurement side, right? So, offering them options of uh, online orders, uh, you know, and and this is largely uh, urban markets right now. Eventually, uh, you know, would be spreading down to rural markets as well. Got it. Uh... Anything um, else? Uh, any insight? I think uh, this this would uh, be the full session. Um, I think uh, we have uh, come to our time. But uh, lastly, I I would like to thank uh, all of you for joining. I think uh, all of us have seen uh, many different stories here um, who can uh, talk about their journeys in a long, long way and. I think few years down the line, we will all look look back probably <laughs> at few of these webinars talking about what were we thinking back then when we started this. Uh, I think everyone here has few years of experience now, minimum in this sector who have scaled the businesses here. Um, not many people have the uh, time or courage to get into this and solve the problem at the last mile. And this is a very tough sector to crack. Uh, so hats off to everyone and the entrepreneurs and other founders solving the problem for the Indian agri ecosystem. Kudos. Up uh, over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone, for an engaging discussion. And a special thanks to all of you for being here and making this possible. And another thank you goes out to all the attendees as well who are here with us today. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, please stay tuned. We'll be back with the next session in a moment. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.